Today we're going to discuss the well-ordering principle. Over the next few lectures, we're going to discuss the following sets. So let's talk about some notation. First we have the natural numbers. We can think of this as the collection of whole numbers, that is integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. However, we don't have to choose 0 to be a natural number. In fact, throughout this course, we will not have 0 to be a natural number. We can expand that slightly by looking at the integers. So this will be the whole numbers as well as their negatives. So for example, the integers would contain 0, plus or negative 1, plus or negative 2, and so forth. This notation is inspired by the German word Zollen, which just means number. We'll also consider the set of rational numbers, that is ratios p to q, where p and q are integers and q itself is non-zero. We can really think of the numbers here as just quotients of integers, hence the reason that we use the letter q. We have the collection of real numbers. For the moment, we're not really going to talk about these, but this is going to be one of the main foci of the course. We'll spend some time in the next few lessons actually defining what a real number is. And once we define real numbers, we'll introduce the idea of complex numbers. These will be numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and i here is just the square root of minus 1. Here you can see a diagram that explains how all of these are related. In the very middle, you have the natural numbers. This is kind of the place where we typically start. As we expand out, we can consider the negative of the natural numbers, hence the integers. We can also consider quotients of the integers. So for example, negative 7 over 11. That'll be an example of a rational number. We'll expand that even further by looking at real numbers. So we can have the square root of 2, the number e, the number pi. And then we can expand that even further by looking at complex numbers. So numbers of the form i, which remember is the square root of negative 1, or even 1 plus the square root of negative 3. Those would be examples of complex numbers. But let's spend some time today focusing on the collection of natural numbers. Remember that we're defining natural numbers as just the positive integers, so we are not going to include zero. We can actually focus on subsets of the natural numbers, and they have a very special property. They satisfy what's called the well-ordering principle. If you have any non-empty subset of the natural numbers, then this always has a smallest element. For example, you could take maybe the subset consisting of the odd integers. These would be 1, 2, 3, 5, and so forth. Well, there is a least element, namely the number 1. Or we might want to consider p here to be the collection of even integers. That might be 2, 4, 6, and so forth. In this case, the least element might be the integer 2. Unfortunately, this property of well-ordering fails if you consider not just subsets of the natural numbers, but subsets of the integers. For example, if we let p here be the collection of all integers itself, there is no least element. Well, if there were a least element, maybe let's call this n, I can always take n and subtract 1 from it. There we would have an integer that's even smaller. So again, the integers have no smallest element. Well, you might say, well, if we keep going to the left, if I have a number, if I subtract 1, then it makes sense that there's no smallest element. But what if there were, let's say, like a lower bound to what I can choose? So what if maybe I were to consider the set of positive rational numbers? So here now, everything is bounded below by 0. Well, unfortunately, it also fails. That is, the well-ordering principle does not hold. See, if I did have a smallest element, I could always take the element and divide it by 2. So for example, maybe if that smallest element were 1 third, if I were to divide that by 2, I would find 1 6. So I would find a number that's even smaller. Well, there's really not much special here by saying, let's consider the natural numbers so that we start at the number 1. We could say, <clears throat> take a look at the same property, perhaps if I let the natural numbers include the number 0. In fact, if I were to take any non-empty subset of the integers, let's call this s, that maybe were contained inside of a collection of integers that had a lowest bound, 
call that element n0, then the same well-ordering principle holds all over again. So that is, instead of looking at, let's say, a subset of the natural numbers that has the lowest bound of 1, I could look at a set that has the lowest bound of 0, or I could look at really any set that has the lowest bound, call it n0. Then the same property hold to be true. Well, the simple explanation is, what you can always do is take that set that has say perhaps is contained in another set that has the lowest bound n0 and just subtract n0 from it and add 1. So the point is that now you're back in the set of the natural numbers again. You can always just kind of translate things and move things around. And then once you have that, then you'll see that there has to be a smallest element because we've just reduced it to the well-ordering principle again. Simply put, there's really nothing special about whether 0 is an element of n or not. The same property holds true. Here's a quick exercise to try to figure out why exactly is that statement true? Why does the well-ordering principle hold? Here you can try to use mathematical induction to prove that every non-empty subset of the natural numbers does have a smallest element. Let me sketch to you how you would do this. Let's let P denote a non-empty subset here of the natural numbers. And again, we will always assume that the natural numbers starts at the integer 1. Well, if p did not have a smallest element, what we're going to try to do is find a contradiction. So let's let s denote the set of natural numbers that are not in p. We would call this the complement of p inside the natural numbers. We're going to find a contradiction by three steps. Step 1. I claim that the integer 1 is an element of s. Well, if 1 were not in s, then by our construction, 1 would have to be inside of this set p. But we just said that p has no smallest element, so the number 1 cannot be there. Hence, we find a contradiction. So we do see now that the element 1 must be in our complement s. Next, I claim that if I worked inductively, so let's say maybe if I can show that none of the integers 1, 2, 3, up through n were in s, then I'll actually prove that the next integer, n plus 1, is an element of s. Well, again, let's try to prove this by contradiction. Let's say that the integers 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 through n are elements of s. Let's take a look now at n plus 1. Well, if n plus 1 were not in s, then it would have to be in p. But we know that p has no smallest element, so there must be an integer less than n plus 1 that is in p. But if that element were in p, then this means that it would not, could not be in s. And we now find a contradiction because all of the elements 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 up through n are elements in S. So now what we've just shown is that if we know that the integers 1, 2, 3 up through n are in S, that implies that the next integer, n plus 1, is in S. So we see here, by using what's called strong induction, that S must contain all positive integers. But if S contains all positive integers, then P itself, remember is the complement of S, must have no elements, so p must be empty. But remember, we were assuming at the very beginning that p is non-empty. So, since we know that s has to be all natural numbers, this gives us a contradiction because then p must be the empty set. So in all of this, let's talk about an application of why this is even useful to begin with. I want to go over a couple of definitions. Let's let n be a natural number. Remember, n here could be 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. It's always a positive integer. I'll say that an integer d divides n if n is d times n prime for some other integer n prime. Similarly, we'll say that an integer d does not divide n if we cannot find such an integer n prime. So we're going to use this to write out an algorithm. 
Let's let A and B be natural numbers, that is, positive integers. Well, we know using division, if we try to divide B into A, we'll have a quotient that we'll call Q0, and we'll have a remainder that we'll call R0. And of course, the remainder here must be strictly less than B, since B is the element that we're dividing into A. We can continue in this way to find a series of steps. So we can write A equals Q0 B plus R0. Again, we're trying to divide B into A. But now if R0 itself is non-zero, then I can divide R0 into B. And I'll have B equals Q1 R0 plus a new remainder R1. If R1 does not equal to zero, I can divide R1 into R0. And I can continue in this fashion as many times as I like. But at some point, we have to find a remainder of zero. We can't keep going indefinitely because of the well ordering principle. At some point, we do have to stop. So we'll let D be the least remainder that is positive. That is, D here is the least element in this collection of remainders that we get that are non-zero. This D we give a name, and we call this the greatest common divisor of A and B, and denote it by GCD. We'll say that two positive integers A and B are relatively prime if their GCD is one. That is, their greatest common divisor is just a unit. Now what I'd like to do is explain some applications of all of this. Why is it that we're even defining here this algorithm? Why is it even that we're talking about the greatest common divisor? Well, there are three statements that I'd like to make here. Again, let's say that A and B are positive integers, they're natural numbers, and let's let D be the greatest common divisor. First, I want to explain why we're calling this the greatest common divisor. Well, first of all, D here is a divisor of both A and B. That means that I can write A as D times some other integer, and I can write B as D times some other integer. Moreover, if D prime is any other integer that divides both A and B, then D prime must divide D as well. That means that D must be a multiple of D prime. D equals D prime times another integer. Hence, the reason why we're calling D the greatest common divisor. It is a divisor, and any other divisor must divide D. Second, we'll use this idea to express A and B as what's called a linear combination, to write D itself as a linear combination of A and B. I claim that there exists integers x0 and y0 such that a times x0 equals b time, plus b times y0 equals d. Again, d here is a linear combination of a and b. In fact, the converse of this is very strong. Given any integer m, any integer that you want, the equation ax plus by equals m has an integer solution in terms of x and y if and only if d divides m. That is, m equals d times some other integer. In this case, we can actually find that there are infinitely many integer solutions x and y to this equation. So simply put, as long as m equals d times another integer, then this equation, ax plus by equals m, has infinitely many integer solutions x and y. Here's an example to explain where this is coming from. Let's let A equal 31 and B equal 4. Well, we're going to try to compute x0 and y0 such that our GCD is 1 and we have AX0 plus BY0 equals 1. First, in order to work this out, we'll just run through the steps of our division algorithm. So for example, a is 31 and b is 4, so we can divide 4 into 31. We find that that goes in 7 times, and we have a remainder of 3. The 7 here is in red, and the remainder 7 here is the quotient. That's our 7 in red. And 3 here is in blue. That's our remainder. Similarly, we can divide 3 into 4, 
and we find that it goes in once with a remainder of one, and then we can divide one into three, that goes in three times with a remainder of zero. The quotients here are Q0, Q1, Q2 are all in red, and our remainders here, R1, R0, and R2 are all in blue. Well, I have a remainder R2 that's zero, and the one just before, namely R1, should be our GCD. So in this case, the GCD, greatest common divisor, is just one. On the other hand, we can use all of this to try to figure out solutions to our equation. The algorithm simply says that all we have to do is just figure out, working backwards from the algorithm, what is our Q0 and Y0? The way that we'll do this is just by multiplying out the matrices that you see here. So we see by looking at the top row, x0, y0 should be negative 1 and 8. And you can just simply check that a times x0 plus b times y0 equals 1. So x0 and y0 being negative 1 and 8 really is one solution. Finally, putting all of this together, we can find infinitely many integer solutions by simply plugging in the various numbers. So given any integer tau, we have a solution x is negative 1 plus 4 tau and y equals 8 minus 31 tau. So for example, when tau is equal to 0, we find our initial solution, negative 1 comma 8. But when tau is equal to 1, we find a new integral solution, namely 3 comma negative 23. So again, we see here that not only are there infinitely many integral solutions, but we actually have a formula that tells us exactly what they are. Thanks for listening.